guys. So this is a response video to Mike the Vegan's recent video, Preventing Deficiencies on a Vegan Diet. But I do want to start by briefly addressing a video that he did several months ago called Unnatural Vegan Whole Food Diets Are Crazy, uh, because many of you have wondered why I never responded to it. I never responded to it because the video was one massive straw man uh, with respect to my video, my video on alienation, where I talked about alienating uh, crazy vegan diets. Um, the title alone is shameful since I specifically said in the video that a diet predominated by whole foods, a whole food plant-based diet, obviously is not crazy. What I was criticizing was the way in which certain whole food plant-based advocates promote the diet to other people. Um, the diets I specifically referred to as crazy were raw till four and fully raw. I would like to think that Mike just misheard what I said when he watched my video. Um, he's obviously a big advocate for whole food plant-based vegan diet. It's certainly possible that when he heard, you know, crazy and whole food plant-based so close together that his brain kind of heard what it wanted to hear. He heard whole food plant-based is crazy. It's hard for me to believe that though when he intentionally edited his video to make it look as though that's what I said, to make it look as though I said whole food plant-based, I realize I'm saying whole food, <laughs> whole food plant-based is crazy. See for yourself. Next up is uh, crazy vegan diets, you know, unsustainable, over-the-top extreme vegan diets. Um, not only are diets like fully raw and raw till four unhealthy, but they're also really off-putting to most people. I'm also going to include the whole food plant-based movement here um, as well. While, you know, eating a diet predominated by fresh fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, legumes, obviously is not crazy. Uh, the way that it is promoted by some followers, unfortunately, it's not exactly rational and it's not very inclusive. You know, demonizing processed foods like mock meats and even shaming uh, those who prefer them over beans, it's not really good activism. She went further and said that whole food vegan diets are bad vegan advocacy. Next up is uh, crazy vegan diets, you know, unsustainable, over the top extreme vegan diets. I'm going to include the whole food plant-based movement here. Oh my god. So why would she say this? Back to her video. The way that it is promoted by some followers, unfortunately, it's not exactly rational and it's not very inclusive, really off-putting to most people. I also want to mention that Mike did message me following his video after he published it, um, just apologizing for some of the comments on his video, people being mean about me basically, um, which was unnecessary. He's not responsible for people leaving mean comments about me, um, but it was still appreciated. I responded with some concerns that I had regarding his video, other than the fact that he completely misrepresented me of course. In short, I explained that most people don't really care about health. Look at the number of people who smoke or eat fast food knowing that it's unhealthy. And this goes for most vegans too. Trying to force his vision of optimal, perfect nutrition upon veganism rather than just helping people achieve adequate nutrition in a way that works for them and helps them to stay vegan is harmful. It's great to give people the option to eat even better, to try to eat optimally if that's what they want to do. And it may be particularly useful if you are preaching to the narrow demographic of people with chronic diseases. But that's not what Mike is doing. And his recent video, Preventing Deficiencies on a Vegan Diet, is a good example of that. By now you probably know that I advocate for a whole food vegan diet, but for people just going on a vegan diet, there's a tendency to continue restricting beyond the animal products to an unnecessary level. So I would say if restriction is an issue for you or you're overwhelmed by a vegan diet period, then you should just focus on getting animal products out of your diet and feel free to eat a slightly junkier diet in the beginning. That was great until the last part. Like, seriously, we should feel free to eat a slightly junkier diet in the beginning? How gracious of you. How about in the beginning or at any time, if we just want to and we aren't preoccupied with obsessive orthorexia? How about if we don't have or aren't at a high risk for terrible chronic diseases? How about if we just don't have the time or the money 
or access to the rare foods that Mike requires? And how about if we care more about reducing animal suffering than we do about following some whole food plant-based dogma? Every day, up to nine tablespoons of chia seeds for the ALA to convert to DHA to be safe in case your conversion is low. 100 grams of pumpkin seeds for zinc, which FYI, pumpkin seeds are very high in omega-6, which will make your conversion of ALA to DHA worse. Up to three servings of sesame seeds for calcium, again, mostly omega-6, and extra special vitamin D mushrooms. Maybe Mike should make a new Christmas song to help people remember. On the first day of vegan to avoid deficiency, a half cup of chia, a quarter pound of pepitas, three quarters cups of sesame, and a handful of special vitamin D mushrooms. I tried. In all seriousness, it's a pretty ridiculous sounding diet, right? It's a pretty ridiculous sounding prescription to most people, to people who aren't dedicated to eating a whole food plant-based diet and limiting supplements to the best of their ability, right? And also, what about the calories for all of this stuff? and the cost. So the chia, it's about $2 for 437 calories, sesame, $1 for 573 calories, the mushrooms, $1 for 20 calories, and for the pepitas, the pumpkin seeds, uh, 100 grams, $1.50, 707 calories. So this would already put you over $5 according to like the approximate bulk rates that I'm seeing online. So again, if you were buying this stuff in bulk from somewhere like Nuts Online, um, and that doesn't include shipping, and for the calories, about 1700 calories. To be fair, there is some overlap in terms of nutrients provided by some of these seeds. So with careful tweaking, you know, a bit of tweaking with the amount of things, um, you could come in at around $4.50 and 1200 calories. That's still ridiculous for most people though. And Mike is, he's dictating a level of micromanagement to diet that just is not attractive. To most people. Not everyone is as big a fan as Mike is of chia seeds and chia pudding, which to some of us is like mucusy, slimy disgustingness, <laughs> or, you know, pepitas, pumpkin seeds, or bitter sesame seeds. If you want to eat like this, if you enjoy this type of diet and you have this type of money to burn, great. I'm not going to say that it's not healthy. It can be nutritionally adequate if you plan carefully and if you're not shy about eating large amounts of superfoods as the majority of your diet. Being charitable, all I can say is that Mike rivals Christina at being the most privileged vegan on the internet. He just doesn't seem capable of grasping the concept or he just doesn't want to grasp the, grasp the concept that many people don't want to spend tons of time and tons of money micromanaging their diet so that they can get every last nutrient aside from B12 from whole food sources. It's not easy, it's not cheap, and according to the actual science and experts, there's no reason to believe that it's necessary. Quick point, I am not a dietitian, which is why I will be reiterating the recommendations of dietitians and quoting the nutritional research, which as usual will be linked below. By that, he means quoting nutritional research that he has cherry picked and is not qualified to interpret, and then ignoring the actual advice of dietitians who are qualified, including the very ones he cites. Let's start with the most common concern, protein. After a lifetime of being told that protein is super important, people tend to get triggered when I say that protein is really not a concern here, but please let this sink in. Vegans, on average, have higher blood protein levels than omnivores. Even if that were true, it's not an impressive claim when you compare it to a standard Western diet full of junk food. But you have to remember that veganism has a very high dropout rate. Most people who go vegan do it wrong, and one of the main complaints is health and not feeling full. Could it possibly be that studies like these have a sample bias in long-term vegans who, for whatever reason, eat more protein? Either because they've learned enough about nutrition to know that this is an important thing to do, or maybe just because they happen to really like beans and mock meats? Yes, it absolutely could. You can't just assume that people going vegan are going to eat right intuitively. Most of them apparently don't. And furthermore, that a protein deficiency is only really possible with starvation or an extremely restricted vegan diet. It's entirely possible with intuitive eating, as I have shown in the past. Not all of the people I showcased in that video are eating extremely restricted diets. Some of them are just eating what they want. While we never see vegans with overt protein deficiency, it doesn't mean that all vegans consume optimal amounts. 
marginal or suboptimal protein status can take a toll on health, affecting bone and muscle strength, for example. Vegans who don't eat enough calories or who don't eat legumes run the risk of getting too little of this nutrient. Even a diet that doesn't inherently try to exclude beans and seeds can be problematic. If the person following it naturally has a sweet tooth and so prefers things like fruit and rice and only consumes small amounts, small servings of beans and seeds, it's very easy to fail to get enough protein and particularly enough lysine. So unless you decide you don't want to eat any nuts and any seeds or any legumes and maybe just eat oranges or something, if you eat enough calories, you will get enough protein. That's a bullshit exaggeration, and I think Mike knows it. For every low protein item or recipe that is eaten, something like fruit or rice, it's essential to eat an adequate amount of a high protein item like beans to compensate for it. Calorie to protein ratio in plants varies wildly, so it's a balancing act. Not a difficult balancing act to be sure, but definitely not something that just eating enough calories will take care of, even if you are eating what appears to be a variety of foods. Most whole plant veggies and grains have a decent enough protein to calorie ratio to avoid deficiency. Potatoes are almost protein neutral in that sense. But if a significant part of the diet is made up of fruit or rice, and no, it doesn't have to be a diet of just oranges, and there aren't enough beans, peanuts, etc., to compensate for the protein deficit in the fruit, you will become protein deficient. You can't make up for a low protein food like bananas with a medium protein food like potatoes. The only way to be sure that you are getting enough protein if you are getting enough calories, if that's your metric, just getting enough calories, is to completely avoid low protein foods like fruit and rice. But there's no reason that you should have to do that. Just be mindful of the types of foods that are low and high in protein. And if you do eat low protein foods, make sure to eat some high protein foods like beans in a large enough amount to make up for it. Calorie counting and only avoiding diets that are exclusively made up of oranges is not a reliable way to do this, which is why vegan dietitians Jenny Messina and Jack Norris specifically recommend two to four servings of lysine-rich foods like chickpeas, peanut butter, lentils, etc. every day. Now for the second biggest one, B12. Despite there being many vegans out there like Foley Rock Christina saying that you do not need to supplement, the consensus of plant-based doctors is that you either need to take a supplement or eat fortified foods with B12 every day. This is 100% correct and actually reasonable. It'd be nice if he were like this with the rest of his recommendations. Next up, DHA. If you want your brain to still kick ass when you're 90, then you gotta get your DHA on lock. Down, lock down, lock it down. DHA is a long chain omega-3 fatty acid that your body can convert from ALA, which is a plant-based source, or you can get DHA from fish who get it from algae. Your body can only convert a limited amount of ALA to DHA, so you need to make sure you're getting enough ALA from plant sources or take an algae-based DHA supplement two to three times a week, as many plant-based doctors suggest. I have a whole video on DHA and veganism. You can check that out here. And to be clear, algae-based DHA is not a whole food. It is a highly processed extracted oil. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There is a pattern here though. Every time Mike makes a reasonable suggestion, it deviates from his whole food plant-based dogma. For instance, he could have recommended canola oil as a source of ALA, cheap, readily available, safe, healthy canola oil but he didn't. Nuts are great. I eat lots of walnuts and some chia seeds myself, but not everybody can find nor can they afford these foods. And to recap, many of us do not find obscene amounts of chia seeds terribly appealing. Now to iron. It's ironic that I even put this in here, pun completely intended, because one of my best friends actually cured her lifelong anemia by going vegan, but that's just an anecdote. Yes, that is just an anecdote. And so is this. I have had anemia before going vegan, after going vegan, and while eating an exclusively whole food vegan diet. Only two things have worked for me to keep me iron sufficient, either eating lentils every day or taking a multivitamin every day that's fortified with iron. Since I personally don't like to be forced to eat lentils every day, I prefer to take a multi, I prefer to take an iron supplement. It's cheap, 
it's easy, it works, and it even kept me iron sufficient while I was pregnant. And a quick zinc hack, you can kind of dodge the phytate issue if you snack on pumpkin seeds, which are relatively low in phytates, and 100 grams of pumpkin seeds is about 80% of the normal recommended daily intake. Only 80% of the RDA for zinc, and for many people it would provide almost a third of daily calories and would cost a couple of dollars. To be clear, this is not what dietitians recommend. Good sources are legumes, nuts, seeds, oatmeal, bread, tempeh, miso, multivitamin, or zinc supplement. A modest zinc supplement of 50 to 100% of the RDA should be safe for those who are concerned or having symptoms of zinc deficiency. I didn't see eat 100 grams of pumpkin seeds anywhere in that list. You'll get most of your zinc from food if you eat a lot of beans and nuts, but if you are worried about it, take a modest supplement. It's pretty much calorie free, it costs pennies, and there's no evidence to suggest that it's dangerous in any way. Plus, it's way more convenient, particularly if you are taking it in the form of a multivitamin. Can't really get any more convenient than that. Now, vitamin D. Depending on where you live in the world, this may or may not be an issue. If you get a lot of sun, it's obviously not. But you can also get all the vitamin D that you need by eating mushrooms that are exposed to UV light. As this study showed, they are as effective as vitamin D supplements at raising your blood levels of vitamin D. Basically, spend a dollar or more a day buying special mushrooms, whether you like them or not. Or you could just take a supplement, a vegan D2 or a vegan D3 supplement that's way cheaper and way more convenient. Many multivitamins, like the Deva brand, contains vitamin D2. These are quite widely available at supermarkets, just be sure that they're advertised to have vitamin D. Maybe where Mike lives, but for many of us, not only could we not afford them, but our grocery stores may not always have them stocked or just may not carry them at all. Does he really want people who can't find, can't afford, or just can't stomach these mushrooms to just give up on veganism instead of taking a supplement? Why not mention supplementation as an option, as he does with B12 and DHA? Let's be clear, dietitians do not recommend that people meet their vitamin D needs from mushrooms. Jack Norris is very clear on recommending supplements. If you tried to get that much vitamin D from mushrooms, you'd be spending more than a couple dollars a day on just mushrooms. Again, not only is what Mike's saying going against professional recommendations, it's just making it harder for people to go vegan. Quick point, the widely accepted recommendation is now to not use calcium supplements because they can spike calcium blood levels and help coagulate and clot your blood. No, it isn't. The dangers of calcium are speculative and far from consensus. Norris recommends supplementation for calcium, just not far above the RDI, just to be safe. There is no reason to think that vegans are protected from osteoporosis more than other diet groups, and they should strive to meet calcium recommendations. Although it is possible to meet the calcium recommendations by eating greens alone, the average vegan probably will not meet recommendations without drinking a glass of fortified drink each day, eating calcium set tofu, or taking a 250 to 300 milligram supplement in addition to eating an otherwise balanced diet. Although it is important to eat enough calcium, do not get more than 1400 milligrams of calcium per day. Fortified plant milk, tofu, calcium supplements, all mineral-based, none of them whole foods. He explicitly cautions that in practice, most vegans are not going to eat enough greens to meet their calcium needs. I know I sure as shit don't. It's just much easier and safer to take a modest supplement or to eat a little bit of fortified food, like a non-dairy milk that's fortified with calcium, if you aren't going all out on the greens. Finally, if you really want to cover yourself and you are so fortunate, why not get a blood test every so often? How about instead we follow professional advice and take a few safe, cheap, effective, convenient supplements? With those concerns taken care of, you will no longer have to be concerned with eating cholesterol, eating heavy metals in fish, eating hormones in dairy, and you can enjoy lower rates of diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and many more diseases. All while lowering your environmental footprint and no longer paying for bad things to happen to those cute little animals that you love. Maybe I'm overanalyzing it, but to me that just comes across as incredibly patronizing to ethical vegans. 
So I want to end this video very briefly just talking about uh, Joel Furman, Dr. Joel Furman, who actually led me to veganism. Maybe I'll do a separate video talking about my journey to veganism. I'm no big fan of his for various reasons, but I did really appreciate in a recent interview, I believe it was with uh, John Kohler, when he said he made clear that his diet is for people who want to eat the healthiest diet possible. He fully admitted that one can be healthy and reduce the risk for major killers like heart disease, significantly reduce the risk for things like heart disease without going to such extremes as what he promotes. Bite Size Vegan is another good example. Emily has an utterly ridiculous <laughs> lettuce and banana peel diet, but she is clear that you don't have to eat like her to be vegan and that there's no wrong way to be vegan. While I would argue that there is a wrong way to be vegan if you aren't getting enough essential nutrients and then relapse because of it, the sentiment is well received. The bottom line is that Mike's recommendations are not necessary for health. They are recommendations for people like himself who want to avoid supplements as much as possible. But instead of being upfront about that, like Joel Furman or Bite Size Vegan, Mike presents his diet as appropriate for everyone. It's clearly not. It's unnecessarily restrictive, it's expensive, and it's difficult to follow. So that's it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Of course, if you have any comments or questions, you can leave it down below. And I almost said to subscribe, subscribe, but I'm gonna try not to do it anymore, but I just did it, so what are you gonna do? Thanks again, guys. I'll have a new video very soon. Also, I know many of you might be uh, waiting for the second follow-up. Yes, the second follow-up, which will be on Alienation. It will be up very soon. I just thought this would be a nice little break in between. So yeah, stay tuned for that.